everybody, this is Ruben Bendive, and you are listening to La Lista, a Latinx writer's podcast. Today, my guest is a writer I admire very much. First saw their work last year at Brown and Out 4, and had a scene that, like, steamed up the whole theater. Everybody was feeling it. <laughs> and... And yeah, I'm happy to have him here today. So I usually have my guests introduce themselves. So a little about who you are, what you're about, also how you identify. Okay. What's up, people? What's up, Ruben? Hi. Uh, my name is Gilbert Salazar. Uh, I am the oldest of three kids. The uh, first generation born here in the U.S. on my mom's side and on my dad's side, like y- generations here in this land. Um, currently living in Long Beach, uh, but from Santana, Santa Ana, and I identify as queer and Chicano. You know, I know this is a loaded question for Latinx people. Give it to me. Where are you from? Um, you know, I, I mean, I just said earlier I'm from Santana, but yeah. as I've been doing a lot of research on my beast abuelo, my great grandfather, mm-hmm. um, and so, and studying a lot of his people. And so... He is my my ancestral land is um, like many of us myself is um, in the borderlands. And so before there was a border, those were my ancestral and still are my ancestral lands. So my abuela, my mom's side was born in Durango and my abuelo on my fa- on my mother's side was born, born in Sonora. Um, his father is a member, was a member of the the Ano Odam people, tribe, um, which is comprised in like what we call, what is called in Southern Arizona and Northern Mexico. Um, my two grandparents on my dad's side are from like Colorado, New Mexico, and they their families were established in the land that's we call the U.S. for many, many generations. Um, but so I, f- I feel like I'm burgeoning my definition of myself from saying I'm from Santana, from Santa Ana, which is where I was born, which is where uh, Orange County was where my parents met, where my grandparents, my abuelo's house was, and so where I started school, where all of my early childhood experiences are f- from mm-hmm. and centered. Um, but I'm expanding the roots that have, uh, uh, that have all, always been there. Um, and so my ancestral people are from the desert. And uh, via the desert, via travel, uh, via Tijuana and Mexicale, and then uh, created a home in Santana. And so my home place feels very much like Santana uh, and in the desert. And how did you, like, how did you, how did your family end up in, like, Santana? So my abuelo, first of all, was a, a construction worker in like near Tijuana and the way the story goes is that when my abuela and her sister one of many sisters when they were walking across the street um he was the only one that did not whistle at her (laughs) and so between months of courtship they got married and uh lived in Tijuana and Mexicale Mm -hmm. and um they all of my tios except for one and my tias were born on the Mexican side of the border in Mexico. And they wanted to move and live uh, on the other side of the border, I think for work. Mm -hmm. And so my abuelo, I I don't know for how long exactly, but he um, got his papers and like was able to cross over for work Mm -hmm. um, and worked as far as like Salinas. He picked oranges and onions um, in Orange County and then up in the Central Coast, Central Valley. And so he did that to send money back to yeah. send everybody over. And so they, when they crossed, they lived in San Isidro. Um, and then I think eventually they were able to, I don't know if they, I forget if they knew somebody in Santana. I don't know how exactly they made it from San Isidro, which is like in the San Diego County area to Santana, which is in Orange County. But that's where they, they eventually moved and bought a house. Um, and so the house that I was really brought up in was the house that they, my my mom and my tios like went to middle school and high school in a lot of people have this story of like how they ended up in southern california mm-hmm. you know before there were there would be a more freer migration with the work seasons and 
traveling between, you know, the U.S. and Mexico, and then sort of the law changed, and, you know, people weren't as freely able to move between the two countries. Mm -hmm. So a lot just ended up staying. Um, And one of the reasons I did want to have you on, you know, I I read this, you know, article, essay you wrote about you going back to sort of like... I did read it. It was a while ago, but I did read it. So could you like just talk about that a little bit? Because it's something I really want to talk about. Thank you. Yeah, I forgot I wrote that. I mean, I didn't forget, but I thank you for honoring that story, that journey. Um, I think you're referring to Hunger, which was published on um, yeah. Entropy magazine. And so, yeah, so when I was uh, maybe 34, I wanted to. So when I was in high school, let me start there. Mm-hmm. My mother, somebody found out that their their grandfather um, didn't just have Mexican citizenship, but he also was a member of a tribe. And so he, growing up, they knew very little of their grandfather. Mm-hmm. My abuelo was really raised by um, his tia. And so there wasn't a lot of stories that I heard that they heard about their grandfather, my bisabuelo. And so when they found out, that he was a member of this tribe, uh, there was the option to go and register like mm. in the tribe. And I was in high school. And so my mother was like, you know, we should go, we should all go drive to Arizona, Southern Arizona to go register. And I had so identified as Chicano as a young person um, that the thought of, I mean, I knew that being, Actually, no, no, I didn't identify as Chicano. I think I identified as like Mexican American when I was younger. Yeah. And so I, I, the word Chicano, I don't think really was even in my experience. Mm-hmm. And so I identified with like the mariachi that we heard, with the banda, with the cumbia. And so this idea of indigenous roots or of a tribe was just mm-hmm. not. I was like, I don't, I don't know any of that, and I don't want to go. There was also this sense of me that. I don't want to claim something that I don't know it mm. even then. And so I was like, no, I don't want to go. And then my mother told me that they had scholarship money and mm. she was like, mijo, like we should go. And basically she was like, you know that we don't really have money for you to go to school. And so I had, I don't know if it was a narrative from her or a narrative from school of there's always a bunch of scholarships that exist that people just don't get. Yeah. I don't know how true that is today or how true it was then. Yeah. Um, and so I said yes because of that reason. So we drove to Ajo Cells, uh, Arizona, and I had never been, I think this was the first time, I, I had never left California, I think, mm-hmm. at that point. And so we drove on the 10 through the desert. Uh, I had never really been through the desert. And it, it felt odd to go and we had to go and you take your picture and you sign a paper and you we I got this like ID card and that said like, you know, member of the To'ono, like Oodham Nation. Mm-hmm. Um, I had no idea what that was. And so I felt like I was stealing something that wasn't mm-hmm. mine. And I didn't know who my great grandfather was. That, that was really the thing that yeah. I was like, I don't, I don't know who you are. There's a picture of me as a baby being held by this like a very older woman, this Vijita, this elder, um, who's my great grandmother. And so I, I was told that. So I felt that I could see who she was, what she looked like. She was holding me. I felt, you know, so I, I knew, I didn't know very much about her, mm-hmm. but I had that picture. I didn't know anything about him, but I went and I did apply for this, a scholarship. And years later, when I did go to undergrad, I, on my second year, I did receive it and it helped me. It funded the, the, the nation funded my second and third year of undergrad. Mm. And in that time as a college student and like, you know, learning and questioning, analyzing, um, I got more and more curious about who that part of me was. Mm. And then at that point, even years before when I was like around 19, I identified as Chicano. And so by the time I was, I went to undergrad, which I was in my early twenties cause I went to community college for a while. Um, I wanted to know what the indigenous root was of that identity and mm-hmm. who he, but who he was specifically. And so, yeah. but it really was, it hasn't really been until the last few years that I've been inquiring more about him. And I went a second time to the reservation during undergrad 
to apply for another scholarship. I think for, it was for grad school. Um, and that was the first time that I was like really there with the friends, like on the reservation and looking around and, and seeing people. Um, but it wasn't until like a few years ago, I wanted to go on my own. Like I wanted to go and take a trip on my own um, to learn more. And so I did go, and by then I had known the the controversy over ID cards and having to register. And uh, I oddly enough had lost the card, mm-hmm. and so I I needed another one. Needed being like I didn't have the first one. Yeah. So it was a really good reason to go. Uh, and there's this like sacred mountain that I had been reading about. I just wanted to go. I wanted to like talk to people. I wanted to eat food. I wanted to like be in the desert. By then I had known that the desert was something very sacred for me. And so then I had figured out, Oh, well, this, this connection to this place makes sense. And so I, my journey on my birthday years ago was to go on my own. Um, and on the way there, I wrote, I write a lot about in the essay about the Sawaros, which are these huge, huge cactus. And they look just like people. And as I was driving by myself on a very lonely road, um, they were so powerful for me. It was like a city of, people but they mm. are sabados and toono tawano ooda means people of the desert um and there is a i forget the the word because I, I ended up a few years ago taking an online class from the from the community college on the reservation of the language and i forget now what the specific word is for sabado but i think it, it also connects to people or to ancestors i believe mm-hmm. so there was all that, there was this feeling of all of these feelings that I have are there for a reason. And mm. so it was where I think through research and through the trip and the experience, like this feeling and this spirit and this like analytical brain have aligned of like, oh, this all makes sense. Definitely. Mm. And so I'm still exploring. I was in, we were in Phoenix last weekend actually, and I connected with a lot of the Sawados. And so I'm still doing research and, and I still have yet to really find out more about my bisabuelo. His name yeah. was Miguel, Miguel Salcido. But a few months ago, Thanksgiving time, I sat with my abuelo and he, in his older age, has been like telling me, he told me like more stories about mm-hmm. him. So it was like fascinating. So yeah. I'm still learning. Yeah. And, and can you talk about this like ID card controversy? Because I'm not really familiar with it. Yeah. So some, some folks... Um, there's and folks in different native communities. Uh, well, first of all, not every indigenous tribe or indigenous nation is federally recognized. Mm-hmm. And so, in fact, there's a few tribes, folks here in this, here in um, Southern California, California, who are not federally recognized. And so there is the controversy of that and the challenge of who gets acknowledged mm-hmm. and who doesn't and who uh, was removed from their land and is no longer there. Um so for the Ono people living in the desert, there really there was a when the border was created, it it definitely impacted the migration of folks, and mm-hmm. I think that impacted my great grandfather. Um, but some of the from what I know, some of the controversy is, I mean, the, there's that. So the contra- the who gets acknowledged and who doesn't, yeah. and also the fact of why why should I have an ID card to represent who I am, mm, you know, yeah. still within the context of sovereignty, but within the United States of America. Yeah. So it's a little bit that I know about that. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think, you know, it's interesting in the sense that, you know, I, the way I sort of recognize, you know, that, you know, I'm, my family's from Mexico and so I'll speak mostly to that, is that, you know, our roots are in a colonized people, you know, the, the color of, of my skin, the language, the, the native language to my family, the religion we practice or we're raised in is very much a, a result of colonization. Mm-hmm. And I know that to be true for myself. Um, again, I'll only speak for myself. And I know, we again, there, we do have roots in the colonized people, which is an indigenous people. Um, but to me, the line has always felt murky for, you know, because you do see, you know, people, you know, embrace that side of themselves to see, that, you know, be like we were, you know, 
descendant from Aztecs or, mm-hmm. you know, and sort of that gets glorified a little bit. Yeah. I, I've never really felt comfortable, you know, sort of the same reason you said, because I, I couldn't trace the line to, to link my, myself to that. Um, but also you have to get into the historical context that that was sort of the point. Mm-hmm. The point is that you wouldn't have ties to it. So you wouldn't carry it on and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I have never really felt, you know, like I could identify or, or embrace uh, a native identity, you know? So to me, that's really the only aspect that I knew about, you know, indigenous people within the Latinx community. And it wasn't until I m- even moved to Southern California where that where the line, or I wouldn't say the line, where the, I, the two identities are very much, you know, um, intertwined, you mm-hmm. know, like I know a couple people that are, you know, from the Southern California area that identify, you know, as Latinx and also have, you know, native ancestry too. And also that can get complicated because at one point, at what point, and I don't know the answer to this is Latinx like also a part of nativeness or, mm. or is native, you know, like, and, and that's why I want sort of wanted to talk to you about it because I wanted to know that journey of like, what is it to actually ha- know of a, of a direct link and sort of like excavate that and sort of like figure out where you fit in on it. Yeah. You know, I think, I guess some people, some Latinx people might be like, Oh, that that's so awesome that, you know, mm-hmm. and in a sense it is in a sense it isn't because it, it requires work yeah. <laughs> and, time and work um and i i th- i think what i've recognized is like i didn't have to do much growing up as a chicano boy in santana as a first generation um as a first generation like chicano boy mm-hmm. in orange county because my family's mexicanoness and borderlandness was mm-hmm. around me yeah um and so you know, all I have to do is really like think about a song or a saying or a story that I was told or that it was in the house growing up that connects me to that identity. Um, but when I think about this other identity of myself, like it, it requires work and questioning and travel and like being, yeah. and it's all really beautiful, but there, there's more work that I, I have to do that I choose to do. Yeah. Um, that isn't available on Google. You know? yeah, yeah. You know, it requires like the primary source of a person yeah. and uh, the primary source of a non human person, like mm-hmm. actually being in space and land, mm-hmm. which I think is also why my, my abuelo's house, like the actual physical house in the backyard were such where the backyard was the most important feature of me, of my upbringing of all mm-hmm. of, of all of my cousins, because we, spent so much time in the backyard in the backyard my abuelos grew everything like everything was grown in the backyard and was brought mm-hmm. in or was was cut and eaten in the backyard and so there's always been a connection to land that i think is like the deepest connection that we can have in terms of cultural identity but also as you said like the force the removal and the injustice and the violence of removing people from land. Yeah. Um, and also that land can also be adopted. Like, mm-hmm. you know, like that land in that backyard feels as powerful. If I were to go in there today, which they sold their house a long time ago, mm-hmm. I don't know if it would feel as powerful as if when I go and I see a sawado in the desert, but they're both powerful. And so I, for me, it's, it's been about work and curiosity, but it's also been about this, like, am I, am I worthy to go to this place, to this like new yeah. place? Like I, I don't, I may not look like those of you that I'm seeing in Southern Arizona, mm-hmm. in this reservation on this land. Um, and all I can claim is a great grandfather that I don't know that mm-hmm. I share like a last name. Yeah. And that's really hard too. There's like my own doubt Whereas, but yeah, even in, I used to live and work in Salinas because I did undergrad in Monterey County and, you know, Santana, Southern California is very 
acculturated, very, my upbringing was very Chicano. It was mm-hmm. a mix of both worlds. Like the language in my family is very borderland. It's a mix of like English and Spanish together. Yeah. And <laughs> when I, when I went to native speaking Spanish class in high school, I had a, um, I learned that some of the words that we use are not actually Spanish words. Like oh, yeah. They're just really where that my family was for lived on the very border. Yeah. And so there was all, there also been moments in my life when I felt I, I wasn't um, Latino. I wasn't like Mexican enough. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when I went to college, there was moments when I didn't feel as Chicano enough. And mm-hmm. so, which is why the idea of the borderlands and this third space is like liminal space yeah. is so important for me. Um, and I think the desert kind of, physically symbolizes that like land that used to be an ocean is now a desert and what some people might think of being a like empty or a like desolate place has actually a lot of abundance in it Mm -hmm. um so it's been it's been it's been challenging writing that piece that you mentioned was Mm -hmm. a way for me to kind of give witness to that and to like express it yeah yeah yeah, because, because I remember reading that and thinking very much like, you know, you f- feeling some type of way is the best I could describe about <laughs> about claiming that identity and how and, you know, that sort of came to me sort of also in the format of this podcast and, you know, our own my own identity of how you identify and and, you know, what really spoke to me about the piece is that we have this struggle within ourselves about what identity we can claim, embrace the connections we have to it. Are we Mexican enough? Are we Chicano enough? Are we, you know, native enough, native enough. And how some of those are, you know, our oral histories passed down are just natural migrations as families, but that, that it also is, you know, policies, you know, governments, you know, it is like, like so much of like your your identity my identity is so can so be traced back to like a government policies laws that force the changes to happen you know like and then we feel guilty about it we feel guilty that we don't have a connection it's a place that we almost didn't really have that much choice to decide like if you and that's what i sort of want to like get into in this podcast is how you know, we feel guilt or shame about who we are, how the world sees us, how we see ourselves. And sometimes at that, those are done by forces completely out of your control. Yeah. I, I think I, and I'm, sometimes I think of my, is this doubt, this insecurity stemming from a understanding of culture and cultural appropriation through the lens of whiteness? Yeah. Like if I was, if I was a white person, if I saw a white person where, you know, like the other day, like living, like being in LA, you can see a white woman wear like a wipil or wear like a dress that you would see like a native Mexican woman wear in Mexico. And I feel some type of way about that. Yeah. And yet if I were, if there was a piece of cloth or a color or something yeah. from the tribe, from the Tawano people there's this question for me of am am i worthy to wear that Mm -hmm. even though a a piece of my blood may be connected but there is there still can am i able to do that and so i i it's almost like i i don't want to be viewed or have the angst that i might have against some folks whether they be white or someone else and i i think about cultural appropriation a lot and i've had discussions about this a lot and so it's such a boxed way of living at the same time yeah and so, and how do we work through that living in a city like LA? But I think for me, the the very thing is the first step is around recognition. And yeah. so for me, it was important to know the name of the tribe, to like know some of the language, which I'm still learning. I don't know if I will ever, I, don't, I, I, I still don't feel, I don't feel comfortable mm-hmm. being, if I was to ask to like speak as, a native writer like mm-hmm. i don't know yet if i if i would be able yeah. to claim that yet i don't know yeah and and again like i don't want to be speaking for like native you know people culture organizations people that like but but i will speak to like the latinxness of it is like our identities are the choices of individuals of like mm-hmm. government 
but at one point are we gonna feel like like we are enough like it's a am- like isn't it just like this amazing incredible thing that there can be this chicano kid in southern california who has like these native roots and that all this other stuff that was going around 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 the world that shaped this person and isn't that a beautiful thing mm-hmm. isn't that amazing that this person exists that but instead we look at the things we've you know we've lost and and the connections we don't have and we don't celebrate like like aren't i just a darn miracle you know mm-hmm. like isn't it crazy that like we feel bad about our own identity when it's just like it's a miracle that this person even exists somehow you know and that a whole new identity has been done and a new culture and all mm-hmm. this stuff you know like yeah i mean I, the mixed thing about resiliency like i am yeah. a product of the resiliency of various generations mm-hmm. and i want to rem- i want to recognize that mm-hmm. which is a, a big step but i also like i want to learn more about that mm-hmm. and so but if for me just to honor the resiliency of ancestors yeah um in whatever journey whether it was forced or by choice i think is just that idea has really grounded me yeah and i think that's a good word for it too yeah like because all that was trauma yeah that shit is trauma yeah and trauma lives in the body yeah it's also passed down in the dna in the blood um and so i want to think about that resiliency i think we should we should honor both you know i think the doubt of who we are is really the resiliency of like a people mm-hmm. that was able to like, you know, and then, and then we have like this whole new identity for somebody that like, I always say this, so there's one of you, there's a million of you. Mm-hmm. So like, like there's this whole like people that identify or struggle to identify or trying to find their way in their identity. This applies a lot to Latinx people, mm-hmm. maybe a lot, all, all, all people. And the way we measure who we're supposed to be, you know? Yeah, I think, and I also, I just want to say, I think uh, it's been important to honor the calling. Like for me, there's a calling of curiosity to learn more, to be able to honor. Yeah. And so I'm trying to answer that calling. And I think a lot of us, people of color, um, like Latinx folks have some type of calling. Like I think if there's something in the space or air place a non-human being that calls to you like for me i wonder is there something specific about that that is calling that you may not that we may not even know about and so i all of this is complete is very complicated yes and so but i think viewing at it from a as simple as i can there's this calling yeah and so i'm trying to honor that and as 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 much as I can when I can. I recently heard of a term called Chicano Native by somebody who is T.O. or Toon O'odham, mm-hmm. who is also a Latinx. And so I'm like, oh, well, I'm, now I'm, I'm curious about that. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, oh, there's another one. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Third space. Yeah. I love it. Exactly. Like, it doesn't have to be one thing or the other. Yeah. It could be, you know. I do want to know what your parents did. I want to know, like, your, like, you've talked about your household, but, like, who were you growing up? You know, how did you identify? Who were you trying to pretend to be? You know, uh, so my my dad, my father, uh, is a construction worker. All the men in my family like work with their hands. So my abuelo uh, worked with tile. My dad was a construction worker. Uh, the my grand my grandpa my dad's side um, was a mechanic. Mm. And so, and my mother, uh, we stayed at home. She like, um, manages the house, which is, uh, was a lot of work. Um, and she worked when she had to. And so she worked at nights, like she worked nights when mm. my, my parents were often separated after the birth of every child. Um, there's a lot of stress and trauma mm. in the house growing up. Um, so she would work at nights. Um, I had to take care of my little brother when I was like 10. Mm. And so I took care of him at night and my sister, uh, yeah, so she she worked when she had to. Um, it, I think about her. She wanted to be. I forget if it's a stewardess or a pilot. I think it was a pilot. Mm-hmm. And my well, I told her, you can either you can do that, or you can get married. Like there was no there was no third space. Yeah, <laughs> and she was not really encouraged to to go into a career. Um, and she met my dad and. They got married and had babies, so she 
uh, I think there was a lot. There's a, I'm also the product of, of dreams deferred yeah. as well. And I know about her dreams. I mm-hmm. don't know about my dad's dreams other than when times were really rough, like financially, he would say, oh, I wish I would have gone to the military because mm-hmm. then, you know, in his thinking, you would have had those benefits and all that. Yeah, caretaker, you know, like yeah. holding down the front for the family. Exactly. Like, that's the, you Which know, is the, another form of oppression too, yeah. really. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I don't know about his dreams. Mm-hmm. Um, my So I'm the oldest out of like 16, 18 cousins. And so, uh, which is like, you know, is, is a big deal and being yeah. the oldest boy. Yeah. Um, and so I was, uh, my abuela left, she like ran away from her father from the ranch because she wanted to be a nurse. And he was like, no, you can't do that. And so she did it anyway. And so um, being the first born in this country, I I and all of my cousins, but in particular me and also the being, being given the privilege of being male too, yeah. there was always um, very clear visions about who I was going to be or what work I would do. And mm-hmm. so like early on, I would be given like a doctor's kit or like a little lab coat. My <laughs> well, I would always say, you know, like, tienes los manos de un doctor yeah, or yeah. Vas a, me vas a visitar <laughs> en tu Ferrari, you know? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And so I, I actually wasn't encouraged to go outside mm. and work with my hands. Um, my well, my tíos like had all done that. And so I, just was kind of encouraged not to be was encouraged to like reading a book since I read a lot growing up. Mm-hmm. So the things that I wanted to be growing up was like a paleontologist, a journalist, like on TV, yeah. um, like all of those jobs. Um, never really a doctor. And it was never the thing, thankfully, that I had to be this. It was just yeah. that I had to go to school and that I was going to go to college. Mm-hmm. And I did want to go. Yeah. Um, but those are my like my, my career dreams but you know i loved reading like i always read my mother would we would know how many what the maximum amount of books was to like check out Mm -hmm. so my sister aline and i would go and i think in the santana library it was like 24 so we would walk out with like a stack of 24 22 books yeah um to read so we always read that's that's a lot of books. It's a lot of books, and so we would read it. We would like go to restaurants. We would like bring our little books. Yeah. And now I see like little kids with their like tablets, and I'm just like, when I was little, I brought a book. Yeah, so yeah. I was I, I feel some type of way about that too. But that's <laughs> another that's another show. What what was like high school like? Like where did you go to school? Like what was what was the the student body like? What was the culture at the time? You know, who were you? Um, so in the early '90s, um, how there was a recession. Before the recession, housing was cheaper in the Inland Empire, so like in the Riverside area. Mm-hmm. And my oldest Theo had bought a house in a city called Moreno Valley, um, which is like then like out in the desert. And my parents, my, si- my sister and I had been living in my Wallace house. I think we had like a little duplex house in Santana. My mom didn't want me want me to go to the school that was by the house so she like used my wallace address to get me into what was called a fundamental school Mm -hmm. which was like a a public school but there was like a lottery and like a wait list and we had to wear a dress code and we had to wear belts and everything yeah yeah. um and so i i went through that school from k through fourth and then they had rented a house in in moval in Moreno valley um because back then housing houses were like being built like crazy um in the riverside Moreno valley area mm-hmm. and so we moved there i didn't want to move because i didn't want to leave santana and you know growing up like we knew everybody on the block like that was yeah that was life growing up and so to go someplace it was i knew w- that we went to the desert and there was like a brown mountain when we go when we would go to visit my cousins but I didn't want to like live there. Yeah, you don't want to live by the brown mountain. <laughs> <laughs> and so we, for the that first year, we uh, commuted from Moval to Santana. And I went to, we, my sister and I went to school there. My mom was pregnant with my little brother mm-hmm. and had really high blood pressure. And so you know, we would go to bed like super early, like eight. We'd wake up at three. My oh, dad wow. was a construction worker. So my dad always, all for all of my life, would wake up at like 3 a.m., my mom would make, make up, wake up, uh, um, she'd make his burritos, like we was con papa. Mm. And then, you know, she also would wake up too and took yeah. care of him. And then, yeah, so 
but we we all woke up together and we packed the car and we like headed on the 91 to Santana and we did that for a year and then my, my mom was like we can't yeah so then I we all we went to we finished school in like Moval mm-hmm. but at that time in Murma Valley nobody was born there so all of my friends were from like Inglewood Compton mm-hmm. Santana yeah and on the weekends we would all go back to like where we lived where our grandmother's houses were mm-hmm. And so for years, we like did that. And so for years, it was like, you know, Friday, we would go back on the weekend. And yeah. Sunday, our Lebo would like take us, propel us home on the 91 on, on Sunday night. Um, so home was still that home place. Yeah. But by the time we went to high school, we were like, we yeah. move out. Yeah. yeah. Um, high school was all right. I never really like, I mean, it was like, I always felt like so out of place like i was never athletic mm. um i didn't feel like in my body i think i felt really ugly i can relate <laughs> <laughs> to high school and to like the yesterday like <laughs> <laughs> so i i could say i could say that i survived high school yeah you know like i wasn't ready to go to college i was just not i don't know i think if i would have you know what it was i didn't i if i had encouragement and if i had um more courage to like be in the arts in high school. Mm. It would have been a much different experience, but because of homophobia, because of like uh, the macho-ness that is, was my household. Mm. That is this culture. Um, it was never encouraged. It was never even a thought. So I didn't even, I, I went to like one play in high school and it was like the pirates of Penzance. And I remember I was like intrigued and like, half like weirded out by it yeah um kind of like the idea of the calling like it was this sort of like i i want to know more about this i'm curious about this but i would i could never see myself on there so i think it was kind of just that in between sadness yeah that i didn't discover until like later in life but do you think anybody would have given you a hard time about it or was I it a lot of internalized i don't think so like yeah. i i really wasn't i really wasn't bullied mm-hmm like I in middle school, I, yeah, in like middle school, I think I was well sixth grade with my name and yeah. with uh, what's eating Gilbert Grape came out. Like there was a lot of jokes about that. Yeah, but I really wasn't bullied. But I think I was so afraid of being shamed or being humiliated. Yeah, that 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 residue is still in me that I just did not want to stick out in any yeah. way because it's there's safety in that, you know. Yeah, yeah, I feel that for sure. And I don't think that. I don't remember the theater department or the music department or the art classes. I remember them being very white. Like mm. it, I don't know if that's true, but I feel like the image I have, yeah, like the Pirates of Penzance was the play that I saw, which, you know, like, sure, shout out to Gilbert Sullivan, but I don't think there was anything specific that really called me that I knew yeah. about, yeah, yeah, really. Yeah. What did you do after high school? What, what, and what was the plan, you know? I... Uh, always wanted to do a peace corps like i knew what peace corps was i don't know how or where and um <laughs> and so i remember on my my computer in my room with the dial-up sound like back in the day mm-hmm. i saw that you had to have a degree for peace corps and so but mm-hmm. there was a link on the peace corps website for this thing called americorps mm-hmm. which i had no idea what it was yeah so when i clicked on it um there was all these like young people like in uniforms like out in nature or in schools mm-hmm. uh and i was like i want to do that because i had done a lot of volunteer work in high school and yeah. really it was like volunteer and service work that would get me out of the house because i didn't play sports i didn't you know have dance class or anything um i was always afraid i would fall on, on my roller blade so i really did that so <laughs> so 90s yeah <laughs> roller blades are coming back though. <laughs> they are um so volunteering was like my way out of the house mm-hmm. um and I found out that Ameri- in, when you join an Ameri- if you're accepted into an America program, there's also an education award. Mm. And so I knew that I did want to go to college, but I wasn't ready to at the time. Mm-hmm. And so I applied to the National Civilian Community Corps and I got accepted. Um, and my I was going to go to Charleston, South Carolina. And oh, wow. so, yeah. And so I had never left California other than going yeah. to Arizona. Um, but never been on a plane and so i was like so, I was so little and this was back in the day when like your whole family could go to the terminal 
yeah. And so I had never, you know, I had never said, I think if I had said goodbye, it was like for a weekend, like yeah. a church retreat or something. But this was like, you know, a year. And again, being the oldest, like nobody had gone through yeah. this experience. And my mother was like that my well had said like, oh, why are you going to let him go? You can't let him do that. Because in my family, you didn't leave the house until you were married. Mm. And so at 18, like I wasn't married. I was going to college. Um, an uncle left to go to college. But so it was either married or college. And so there was this other option of like a service program. Nobody knew what that was. Third option. Um, <laughs> yeah, third space. Uh, so I did that for a year. And uh, I there was 180 of us from 33 different states. Um, and I was the only Latino. Uh, there was one latina that's a very college experience so i will let you know yeah well, i didn't go to college until like years later yeah and but that is it was different year. <laughs> <laughs> and there was one latina and she was from like north or south dakota brown skin latina but yeah. she had this like dakota accent and so i was so i was like oh so i was so little i had never left california yeah but i want to tell you we would we, our base was in like the old naval base in Charleston and mm-hmm. we shared it with the border patrol mm. and we, the border patrol and AmeriCorps ate together in the galley at the same time, but in separate places. Right. Yeah. And so I remember the first week walking with my tray of like, and you could order like any kind of food. Like it was just there at the galley. It was amazing mm. for an 18 year old um, and really good ice cream. And I remember walking through the galley and hearing the most diverse accents in Spanish I'd ever heard of before and see it was the first time I had like ever heard and met like the Janos and Boricuas yeah. and like Dominicans from New York and like I had I had no idea. Like I had no idea. Yeah. And it was so and like how like I couldn't understand some words and some of them were like super light skinned, some were super dark skinned, mm-hmm. some were Afro Latino. Yeah. Blew my mind. And it was so powerful. And then we, I would go into our own AmeriCorps spaces. And I it took me a while to figure out that I was the only one. Um, but when I did, it was this like interesting experience. On my team, Merla Vake on our team, um, she's Filipina. So there was two of us. Yeah. We were POC folks. But it was majority white folks in AmeriCorps. Um and we served in communities that were mostly like African American, being in the South, not all, yeah, yeah, yeah. or like very rural white folks, which mm-hmm. is also its own very distinct culture. Yeah. And so I, I learned a lot from that year in AmeriCorps. Um, it set me up for life around like what I wanted to do in terms of work, and what kind of spaces I wanted to be in, like what kind of seasons yeah. I liked. <laughs> so I did that, and then I joined another program in a another america program in washington washington state and i lived in like a little tiny town called walla walla and i worked in a bilingual ed school yeah and lived a very romantic life of like walking from my little apartment to the camp to the school this very old old brick school it was like redone but it was like the it was this beautiful brick building um and it was a bilingual ed school because in washington bilingual education is legal Hmm. And so from kindergarten to third grade, it's all Spanish. And then there's English enrichment. Um, and it was so amazing to like hear Spanish in a school because when I was growing up in my elementary school, um, we I was pulled out of classes to be tested in Spanish um, because I, Spanish was spoken in the home. It was my first language. Mm-hmm. My mother had to go to school and be like, no, like my son speaks English. We also speak English. And so she had to really fight for that because the school thought I needed English enrichment. But then I would be tested in Spanish. Yes. And then I I didn't. I remember Mm -hmm. there was like these flashcards and you want to say they were in Spanish. And I didn't know the word for firefighter. Mm -hmm. And then when I was was like little and I felt I felt so i remember feeling so stupid Mm -hmm. like why don't i know this word i know all the other words yeah so then there was this thing of like well i'm being taken out of my class that's Mm -hmm. being taught in english and i can't i felt like i couldn't pass this test yeah and i think i I wanted to please adults yeah and so i think that's that was the earliest experience i have of like this not feeling enough of this and not feeling enough of that and like where do i fit in then like where do i go 
Yeah, the same thing happened to me. Yeah? Exactly. Well, we were also immigrants. So mm-hmm. we came into kindergarten speaking Spanish. But then like six months later, we knew English. Um, yeah. But the same thing happened. I was in like those ESL classes. That's what they used to call them back then. Um, and till third grade, until we took an exam and they were like, you tested higher th- than your whole grade. <laughs> what are you doing in this class? And uh-huh. I was like, oh, okay. And I was just going because they were telling me to. Yeah. But the same thing, like we were testing in Spanish. I, I like, I don't even know how to say noun in Spanish, let alone how am I going to circle the nouns mm-hmm. in a sentence, you know, with the Spanish worksheet, you know? Yeah. The same thing happened where it's just like, this is where you belong. And they're not really like checking to see if you actually need it. Mm hmm. Cause it's crazy because my teachers knew I was smart in my classes. Why wasn't that being relayed to this department, you know? Yeah. But this is where you're placed. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. God, do better, folks. <laughs> uh, all right. So, by the way, that Washington life sounds so amazing. Like, <laughs> it I would have that. It so, so what did you do after that? Then I went to community college. Mm-hmm. So my, my dream school was at the University of San Diego like the the Catholic one on the hill, mm. um, they had like a peace and justice program, um, and having done two years of a service program, and by then I had done research on uh, in Chicano studies because being the only Latino person for a year, there was a lot of questions to me about my experience, and there was a lot of questions from um, the like. Half of us were 18 out of high school. And the other half of us were, were college graduates because the NCCC is 18 and 24. Yeah. And so there would be a lot of questions from those that went to college who had studied Spanish abroad yeah, and were super interested in Latino cultures that would ask me these questions. And sometimes I couldn't know the answer. Sometimes they, they weren't asking questions that pertain to my upbringing. Yeah. So then I, I felt, I, I, again, I felt bad. I was like, wait, I don't know the answer to that. Should I know the answer to that? Mm. Or you're a white person and you're way more fluent than I am. And so that Ouch. was the other, <laughs> yeah. I was like, damn. And so that year in Walla Walla, when I was like 19, I read a lot, you know, and I did a lot of like research on like what Chicano meant and what it means mm. and like where it came from. So I was like, I was ready to go to college. Like I was ready to like be a student. Um, but USD did not accept me, which is like a huge disappointment. Mm-hmm. And so I moved back home and I went to community college for like two years. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in that time, transfer or uh, apply to transfer to CSU Monterey Bay. Um, and in that time, started painting, mm-hmm. which was, I, you know, after seeing the movie Frida. <laughs> uh, I was like, I want to paint, and yeah. so I start started buying brushes and paints and painted this like little table that I had, and then chair, and then I wanted a canvas, and then I wanted a bigger canvas. But even then, like, I painted in my room with the door closed, and so mm-hmm. there was this like, I don't want anybody to know what I'm doing. Um, I don't want anybody to see what I'm doing, and so, and I did all I did that, especially in the summer times when I would go swimming and like, I didn't, I didn't work in the summer times, uh, usually. And so, cause my parents were like, as long as you're in school, like we will take care of you. So yeah. I said, I, was, I said yes to that. I usually still took a class in the summertime. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, but I would paint. And so I, uh, when I think of summer times when I was in my early twenties, like early twenties, I think of like swimming because my parents had a pool in the backyard and I would paint. All right. So, and what were your parents thinking at this time? You know, from the beginning, they were like, oh, you're going to be a doctor, you're a real professional, like mm-hmm. Ferrari. Like, what were they thinking when you were doing AmeriCorps, like community college? Like, w- were they pushing you t- t- towards something? No, they were always really open. Mm-hmm. Like, I know a lot of families and friends that have, like, very parents who, like, had a very clear path and yeah. plan, and mine didn't. They just wanted, they wanted me to go to college. But even if I hadn't, I think they would have been okay. Yeah. I mean, they wanted me to be happy fulfilled um so they were super open to like what i wanted to do Mm -hmm. um and and what i wanted to do was like so not in any box like you know i'm gonna go away to like south carolina for a year now i'm gonna go away to live in a small town yeah 
and now I'm gonna like you know uh, be in my room painting and now I'm gonna like you know go to college but I'm gonna study like peace and justice you know th- like things like that but yeah. they were always accepting of that in college like who who was your friend group like you were studying peace and justice like what what did that look like and like your schooling and, um, and what were you trying tra- did you sort of have an idea of what you wanted to do with that i knew that i wanted to be an educator like education was always you mm-hmm. know, i would play like teacher like growing up like i always just saw my you know education teaching was something that i i did like mm-hmm. the very first volunteer thing that i did was a tutor um for the city and so i i knew that i wanted to do something that was different mm-hmm. i knew that i couldn't be a teacher teacher because i wanted to be in control of my curriculum mm-hmm. and because i had a very social justice lens um and so i I didn't have a clear idea of what I wanted to do specifically while I was in school. I was like really happy to be, to be studying, yeah. to be a student. Yeah. My friend group, um, were like the, the, the friends that I lived with, um, we like lived together for like three years. Uh, and so they were, yeah, we were, and we, we still are like really strong friends. CSUMB was for the most part diverse. Like a lot of families who like, live in the central coast so mm-hmm. a lot of like first year it was a lot of first year college students and when i f- the uh, not the dorm but like my housing situation when i transferred mm-hmm. we were all transfers so we were i thought i was going to be i was like 23 so i thought i was going to be this like old dude um but we were they were all we were all in our early 20s oh that's good because i have this image of like you're 18 when you go to school and you're like 22 when you graduate and you have a job at 23 and like yeah, I just I, all I knew was like what I saw growing up and what I saw with my tios and tias. Yeah, and and that's also very much the culture too. Like, and and is that what you did after you know college? Did you go into grad school? And- no, I worked through like the nonprofits in Monterey County, and mm-hmm. so I like um, my first year. I have a, I had a minor in service learning and mm. so I had actually like designed my own major around mm. peace and justice studies and conflict studies and so my one of my projects was this curriculum to prevent adolescent male violence mm. and one of my last service learning cl- like classes kind of like an internship was at a commu- at a, a program that taught anger management classes for students who were suspended expelled or formerly incarcerated and yeah. so I actually got hired with that job um, to teach a class and so I spent two years teaching mostly boys but it was also girls um the this program had been taught on worksheets and I was like there's no way I'm going to teach anything on worksheets and mm-hmm. so I brought in my curriculum and so we did like I had friends come in to show me like about apply about uh theater of the oppressed so we did we I did theater I did games like mm-hmm. I did a lot of like very embodied very theatrical activities like yeah. I brought in like guest speakers like i did everything that felt right for me extended the eight week class to like 10 weeks and like did a lot of deep work with these young people um and it's one of the i love what i do now but that moment i think being younger learning like applying what i all those passions like is really like the best some of the best work times that i've had yeah. with young people and like really really happy and passionate which then connected me to um, working for the volunteer center of Monterey County. And so there was a, I had had an appointment to go meet with this program coordinator to volunteer for this program called Caminos that was a reentry program for students who were suspended and expelled. Mm -hmm. So the day that I had this appointment with her, she's like, actually, I just put in my two weeks. I saw like what you do, like, you should apply for this job. I just graduated from from college, from high from from college, mm. and I was like, uh, okay, here's my email because she asked for it. Yeah, um, and that was my first full time job. So I was like a caseworker for students who were trying to reenter school, and in that, doing these intakes, I learned the stories of why students got suspended or expelled. Yeah, and so I was able to ask. You know, there's the ed code of if a student is brandishing a knife or a gun, you know, that's automatic expulsion. So the question was, you know, like after 
a one-on-one and spending some time like you know can you tell me why yeah what was the reason why you brought the gun or the knife and the response was almost almost always because i i didn't feel safe like yeah. i need to protect myself and then the next question would be was there an adult on campus that you felt you could say you felt unsafe and the response was usually always like no and so Again, there was like like recognizing the school to prison pipeline, like recognizing yeah. um, the systems of injustice, and recognizing um, how relationships are not a part of everyone's experience in high school. Yeah, um, and the systemic oppression of that. These were all mostly Latino kids, mm-hmm. uh, affiliated, not affiliated. So I did that for two years, but. The dope thing was I had that job as their case manager coordinator, but then I was also, I still kept the teaching job. So, and if you were to, you were going to be re- readmitted, you had to do service hours, which I coordinated, but mm-hmm. you had to take this class that I taught. And so I got to double dip with them. So that was really beautiful too. Um, but after two years, I, I, I did what I could do. And so I wanted something new. And then a friend of mine from college like, was leaving the Monterey County Rape Crisis Center. And so I applied for his job and I got it. So then I became like the rape prevention program manager. And so I went to middle schools and high schools and talked about sexual harassment, sexual assault. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, these really heavy topics about like, what is rape? What is consent? What is force? Yeah. The curriculum that we gave, it was given, was had a lot of storytelling already. So I used that, but I would tweak it. So I would like embody the story. And it was three presentations. And the second one after the sexual assault, sexual harassment, what is force, what is rape, what is consent. The second presentation the next day was on gender stereotypes. Very much about the binary still. This was like years ago. Yeah. Um, and there was a students would, we would do like the gender boxes of, you know, men, like what are the stereotypes we think about, about men, about women. And then there was a story about Ken and Barbie in the curriculum. And it was this thing of like, Ken feels in order to be a man, he has to fit everything in this box. And the box was always like tall, aggressive, like powerful, loud. And Barbie feels in order for her to be considered a woman, she has to fit everything in this box. And the words were always like submissive, quiet, pretty. So then the story was like they're out on a date. And so I like embodied the date. And so then I, there was a story was like, she, Barbie invites Ken to her house, her parents are home. And so I would have, so then I was a kind of like a choose your own adventure to be like, what do you think? So what do you think might happen now? And kids would be like, no, like, she's going to be like, no, no, come in. He's going to be like, no, it's all good. But I was like, but we all agreed yeah. that they had to fit in everything in this box. And you all agreed that these are the things that society tells us we have to be. And then I would just see their like faces drop because then they <laughs> they had they no longer had control of the narrative. Yeah, and the narrative with just everything in those two boxes really led to rape. I mean, it led to no boundaries. It led to no consent. And so I, for like you know, six periods, weeks, two years, like performed yeah. this facilitation. Um, and really loved it because I was able to like just smack paradigms in the face. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then the next cl- pro- presentation was about media representation. Mm. And so that really was like an exercise around facilitation, which I already was very dope in, mm-hmm. but also like the performance of, of facilitation. Um, so I did that. But then after that, I got, I had known about Theater of the Oppressed. Because I had used it, some friends had taught it to yeah. me. Like theater is really powerful, storytelling is really powerful, um, and I was like, I want to know more about this. And I knew that I really loved the performance of it, and I loved for the purpose of why I was doing it. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, and I by then I had met my partner now George, and he had just finished from NYU in like educational drama theaters education masters and so he was telling me about like what he was learning like about trauma and education and theater and i was like well i didn't even know you could do that as a thing like i don't know that was a thing even though i was doing that thing and so i was like i 
like took the GRE and like was like looking at college for like a grad school programs and like applied to Austin for like, I think their public performance studies didn't get accepted. Um, but I saw seen that USC had then an applied leader program for educators, for artists, for activists, mm-hmm. specifically to work with communities who are non actors or like not trained artists to help them essentially tell their story and present it for the purpose of like, rehearsing the revolution or for like conflict but not conflict resolution but for interventions around yeah. the conflict so i was like i want to and i know what theater of the oppressed was and i wanted to be trained in it and i also knew that i needed to push myself to perform and so i applied and i got accepted so that's when uh, george and i moved from salinas to la for me to go to grad school <laughs> and there i was like in voice classes like in clown classes like oh in carnival classes yeah. like in yeah working with like students again i worked in Ingo- i worked in inglewood that was my mm-hmm. internship with my with when was in my cohort and we were at free la high school in inglewood and we taught two sessions of theater of the oppressed for the purpose of them creating a play at the end of the year that year and the play was about like drugs and violence and gang life and we yeah. helped them with that. Yeah, so that was that was me. And uh, see, and this is something because I've known I sort of the time I've known you is just like oh, what I've sort of gleaned from you is that you you're you're about the work, you know, like you're very purposeful and intentional with 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 how you, you know, carry yourself, talk, like interact with people. And it's, it's fascinating to see that you've sort of always been about the work. Like even going into college, you knew exactly like what you wanted to work in. Hmm. And, and I love that because, you know, it's a very certain type of person to, to, to do the work. Um, but it's also a certain type of person to, even know that there's work to be done Mm. you know and and i like that you were then connecting to you know all the work you were doing but then there was this other aspect that you could do the work through you know through like performance through you know theater and and it could be a facilitator for for change and for expression you know Mm. um because you know i've i've always known that you know media representation is an avenue for the work because if you put something on television that is pouring into people's living rooms every day for three to four hours a day you begin to change how people see the how people see each other the humanity in each other you know like like gay stories, queer stories were on TV way before Mm -hmm. the public was on board with it. But because they were seeing it, we're we're sort of seeing the humanity in people that they were able to to shift the culture, Mm -hmm. you know? And and I think the same thing about, you know, Latinx representation. I think that's sort of like the point of this podcast. The point of a lot of the work I want to do is how do we see each other and I, I see the importance and the damage that that representation through media and television and film does to like a culture. Uh-huh. So it's just very interesting to me that like that, you know, because I've I knew that that was a thing that could facilitate change. Um, but I didn't I on my end have just started to unpack and unlearn all this crap that you know we're sold again through media um but i like that you were sort of just always like clicked into that tuned into that that like that like what the general consensus is 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 damaging and you know like like you going to talk to those students about anger management and stuff like that It's like so many people would just write them off as like violent, dangerous and and not worth anybody's time Mm -hmm. and not worth the effort or not see the humanity in them that like 
this is a consequence of so many things and all you're seeing is a reaction to that the trauma the everything that's been passed down so yeah. it's fascinating to hear all the work you've been doing i mean i'm really fascinated by a story yeah and oppression yeah. is a story mm-hmm. and so i i've always been fascinated by a story and so i and particularly one that isn't i don't know about isn't told or yeah. is like there and young all young people have a story and mm-hmm. it's like right there and so are just not challenged or, or nurtured to be able to give that story yeah and so it was so important for me to be in in those spaces but then i recognized that once they had their story knew of the story expressed it then they would go back into the same schools that you know that pushed them out yeah so then i i realized that the the next phase of work was not with young people it was with the adults Mm -hmm. which was even more and to this day most of the time often much more challenging yes because adults particularly adults in schools have been so detached from their own stories and so what i do now in restorative justice work is to connect people back to their stories um because stories are powerful and i always say when i do a training that stories and identities are the deepest things that we have to teach and to learn from yeah so and i want to get into where the writing came in you know, when did you start writing work that would be read, would be performed? You know, when that happened? Um, so I would always be uh, in my room, like door closed, listening to music, like really isolating myself. This mm. is like I'm thinking about like high school. Um, I think always just feeling, not always, but I think in terms of like when I was adolescent, like feeling like out of place Mm -hmm. and so i started doing a lot of journaling um i would watch a lot of old movies and so i i think and i started like just dreaming like thinking of like what a different reality would be like Mm -hmm. or what it would be like if i was more confident or like taller or like good looking or like you know whatever try to be anybody else but you yeah um and journaled and then um i think in high school yeah, I think there was always a sense of justice or a sense of injustice and so I and a sense of expression. And so I I think I remember like early internet days like looking for like zines or like online like places where I could write or submit things. And I remember um one time I and so I always wrote I wrote a lot of poetry. So I would find places to like send poetry and sometimes it would be published. And that was like really amazing to see my name and see like the poem like in print. Yeah. Um, so I think of that, I think of like in community college, I was in the school newspaper and I wrote a lot of opinion pieces about what was happening in the time, like politically, which was like the first Gulf War um, or the second Gulf War, I mean. Uh, and then that was really amazing to see like my, like my thoughts like in print. Mm-hmm. Um and i think that was like a step up because i you know i didn't know who was going to read that poem but i know i had it but then like and not many people read the school paper but it was out there (laughs) yeah um and then i think when i painted like i i used poems and texts and paintings because i i was i was really attached to words um and i think it was I can remember, so the first year of grad school, uh, my I just really, I just come out to my family like the year before. Mm. My partner, George, took me to go see Brown and Out. You probably heard the story. To go see Brown and Out. I have it. Three um, or f- two. I think it was two. Mm-hmm. And it was the first, uh, even though I had done, it was in a theater program. Grad school was really intense. So I actually hadn't like seen a lot of theater that year. Yeah. But he, I think he found out about the the Brown and Out Festival and bought tickets. And so we went and that was my first time in Boyle Heights, my first time at Casa, my first time seeing like any theater production in LA. Mm -hmm. And I just knew it was going to be like short plays about being gay, being Latino. And I was like, okay, but I didn't know what it would feel like to see those stories. Yeah, And I remember 
the next day being in our performance class and it was a she was a teacher who was very strict it was very like her style of teaching was very mean and we had we were about to shift to our last performance style that we were learning and she had us sit on the ground and she asked us like what we wanted to do and she had never been that like she never expressed the type of concern because she was always like yelling at us yeah. and so i thought it was like a trick <laughs> so i was like oh this is weird because we're like you're you're acting now like all of our other professors but okay and so i had said to her to the class my cohort that i was like oh, i just saw this play about like it plays about like gay latino stories like mm-hmm. i like i want to write for theater and she like leaned into the strict teacherness mm. a little bit and she was like if you want to write just write and it was this like slap of paradigm for me and i was like oh yeah that makes total sense so then in my brain i was like when i'm done with this program i'm gonna write um and yeah and so then like the year later i was doing the work that i'm doing now which is restorative justice and i, I worked at a school in watts um and sat in all of the injustices that happen in communities like watts Mm -hmm. in terms of oppression and education and the way adults are treated by a district by administration and how that impacts students yeah and hearing from parents about their experience when they were in that middle school and how just like the cycles of trauma Mm -hmm. and I remembered like all of these, all of these like stories came up for me from all of the years I had spent working in, in, in education. Um, and I was like, I'm going to write, I was trying to take Jose Venus classes as well. Mm-hmm. And we had to do that homework where we had to write a 10 minute scene. And the, she gave a prompt of, you have two characters and one says it's time. Let's go. Something like that. Yeah. I, saw these two boys on a bridge and like they were about to jump Mm -hmm. and so i just like went with that um and it was read it was workshops jaime was in that class Mm -hmm. and it became the two boys became called hercules and eros and one had just come out to the other and they were in high school and it became this story about the two of them and about friendship Mm -hmm. and about like brotherhood and about one being gay and the other one we didn't know but he they were friends um and so we had a reading and my play was the last one of the night and it was jaime a mutual friend of ours from brown and out um that was like that's a big deal you're like the last one i was like what do you mean like isn't that isn't it like doesn't mean it's like the worst one and he was like no you're closing the show and i was like oh okay um and it was the first time i got to like hear my words by two actors Mm -hmm uh in casa this was like maybe a year or two years after seeing brown and out yeah um and so people friends like jaime were like i relate to this and like i want to see more of this and so i having gotten that encouragement i was like wow and so i i started seeing more people in this world um and i was i saw like students and boys that i work with and so some of which um were shot and killed and so i i realized that if i'm gonna so i was like okay i'm gonna i'm just gonna keep writing what is like what was the process of like actually having like full-length play and then having it and how was it received you know so josefina had said to us in classes if you do the work like i will honor your work Mm. and so she was like we're working on 10 minute scenes but all of these could be full-length plays and so she encouraged all of us to write them um and some of us did i did Mm -hmm. and so i i think i presented it to her and she read it she gave me some notes and then at the time, Miguel Garcia, who was the, she and Josefina were the initial founders of Brown and Out, he read it and he wanted to produce a like Brown and Out play reading series and so wanted Hercules to be one of the four. 
And so I said yes. And so he directed and produced the reading of it. Um, and so then I learned like what the what the process of theater is like, like never having been gone through it. Yeah. And in grad school, only having got having gone through a very specific type of theater that was not that was performed that was staged but not in the way in which like a like very typical theater is staged yeah um and it was such a lesson of like vulnerability because i remember the day that we had the reading i had to bring the nine copies of the plays meeting people who i didn't know of who i know now very well but at that time like i had no idea who these people were yeah and there i was at this table like having just met people and my name is all over this table in these big stacks of paper. And we're about to like dig into this story yeah. that nobody knew anything about. Um, they got into it. And like this world that I saw in my head was like, had voices that weren't, that were not just the voices in my head. Yeah. So it was powerful. It was powerful. And then they did it and they did the reading. Like a few people came, friends came. Yeah. Um, and then I think like a year later, uh, Corky Dominguez, amazing director, was like, I want to direct this. And Josefina was like, we're going to produce it as a workshop in Little, and then um, in Little Casa. Mm-hmm. And so then I went through the experience of what a workshop production is like and working like alongside Corky and seeing like his vision with the vision of the pages and like seeing how the actors, you know, their vision of it of the characters as they embody them. And so I learned like the collaborativeness of theater. Yeah. Um, and the release of it and like the vulnerability of it. And like the, the week of tech was the week of the 2016 election. And uh, the two nights before opening was like the election night. And so like we were in <laughs> rehearsal. Yeah. And Josefina left, like, Abel Alvarado, like, was there to, like, think about costumes. Like, he left because it was not, it was, you know, the hope of that night did not happen. Yeah. And I remember one of the actors backstage, like, announcing, like, he won. And it's one of the few times that Corky, I've ever seen Corky, like, be very aggressive and, like, yell. Because we were, they were in the middle of rehearsal. And so two nights later on opening night and then like little castle was like filled with people and josefina was like you know yeah this story is really important now and so she was like i know that you're all friends of uh, many of you are friends of the playwright which was the first time i heard like she didn't say my name she said playwright and i was like wow and to acknowledge the play in the context of the country was also like an unexpected thing my partner at the time was not we were not living together because he was living in kentucky doing a residency for a librarianship Mm. and so i was worried about him and i was like living alone and like there was all of that and so and we they we had about six shows uh and i would sit in the back and um i was super like i was always like i loved it when nobody knew me who's in the audience and opening night, like, Josefina asked me to get up. And I was, like, to the stage, and I was so, like, nervous. Yeah. Like, I didn't want to do it. Yeah. Um, and I remember, like, sitting in the back of the, of the theater. And uh, there's, you know, these moments when, like, the characters are taking a breath together. And I, the way that Corky directed it was in this catwalk. So the audience wasn't facing the stage. They were, like, facing each other. So mm-hmm. the actors would go on the stage and also in between the audience on the ground level and so it was very you know there's like footballs being thrown like it was super you're like in the action yeah and i I remembered like the audience like taking a breath with the actors and i remember like the way that so many male identified cisgender looking men like their emotion their reaction to it and it was so powerful and I, i learned like my this healing this is my healing of yeah. the violence that I had studied that men do to other men and home of my own experiences with like homophobia uh, and like how all of those experiences like came out like in this play we're all watching it and like just the this release from people it was so powerful 
so it was so worth that day of the first reading when my name was all over the table mm-hmm. and like that that complete vulnerability and like here i am like this is a story of people that i know of like students mm-hmm. and so it was this whole like continuation of this vulnerability is here for a purpose yeah and so yeah yeah and and again like you, the the ringing of of it being true doesn't even have to like, speak to someone's personal experience just ha- for like that that minute or that second to be in someone else's shoes and know exactly what they're feeling mm-hmm. and then uh, see the humanity and then have sympathy as if they were you you know and and that's transformative in the sense that if it's someone completely different with you you leave that theater remembering that person mm-hmm. carrying that with you so then when you're in the world you already know them you know and they're like you mm-hmm. yeah it's powerful it's very powerful yeah. and i learned like what it means to be witnessed and that mm-hmm. witnessing is part of is part of healing yeah and without some forms of healing don't need to be witnessed mm-hmm. but for me my greatest healing has come from being witnessed and being exposed and yeah. choosing to be like this is a piece of me or this is reality and just like you know submitting to people experiencing that and watching that and like you know letting them be a witness to it and that was been powerful and more healing than i ever thought it would be yeah so i went into it thinking that this is like the scariest thing i don't want to do this like, yeah. i don't want to be here and then halfway through being like oh this is amazing yeah yeah it's and it's and it's crazy that this is just like the writing you're doing to like you know because it can feel very technical in the mm-hmm. time you know putting a show together selling tickets but then the magic of like a theater which is so special and these like this like box you're sitting in yeah because of the magic of theater is that it's so it's it's ritual like theater is ritual and like yeah. Josefina will talk about that you know you enter this like dark threshold you yeah. are having this common experience there's there's lights there's sound there's movement there's like incantation there's like a recalling there's like storytelling there's a, an opening a closing like that's yeah. all ritual um so so what was like the follow up to 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 uh, to that piece of work you know like I really wanted you know there's yet to be a production of a full production of Hercules mm-hmm. um and so that at that point that was like I, I want to work on a full production of this uh play you know and then came like you know what is it what is what the work of like documenting it and sending it to different theaters mm-hmm. and different like theater festivals yeah. and like <laughs> and then thinking about like money and yeah. pr- that you know <laughs> that topic. yeah like that feeling costs money that feeling <laughs> yeah. costs time that feeling yeah. has to be approved like, the the actor had to be you know had to be paid yeah. so to like the director of the, the theater and, water yeah. for actors like the the cost of pages and scripts yeah the costumes themselves like the snacks yeah all of that and so like marketing promotion like all of that you know yeah <laughs> and so so there was that and there still is that dream of a mm-hmm. uh, uh, production of hercules and then uh but yeah and so i being living in la and being stuck in traffic and being a person who dreams like mm-hmm. at night i was like uh, there's these images which come to my head uh, yeah so i wrote these like small scenes um and I had written a scene about uh, like a barber shop because I was trying to find a barber in LA. Um, That's a struggle. Yeah, it is. It took me like four years. Yeah, it is. Shout out to my to Jimmy the barber in Long <laughs> Beach, A One Barber Shop. There was a class for Brown and Out for writers, mm-hmm. but also to produce it. And so I had heard, I had been told that my name came up in the class. I got asked to if I would submit something, yeah. and I was like, oh, but I I thought you had to be in the class. And so I did, and it was like people that I was like everybody that I knew, and mm-hmm. so, um, well, mostly. And so, I joined, and I, I, it was towards the end, so people had already workshopped their scenes, and I was like, well, maybe I'll just submit this barbershop piece. So I did, and I, yeah, ended up being like one of the writers, one of the producers, and then really learning about the production money fundraising side of theater, which yes. I, it was a whole different beast. 
Yeah. And a whole different lesson around vulnerability mm -hmm. and abundance as a mindset of like asking people to give money. Yeah. And when we did that, we raised like 10,000 by individual ask. A record. And that was huge. Yeah. That was like, you know, there was a lot of friends that some of which I hadn't like spoken to in years that like gave money. And that was really hard for me to receive because yeah. it was, there, I, there was so much love in that exchange so much of like so much faith yeah and it wasn't even like a full production of mine it was like i was a writer of 10 yeah which was made me think of like oh well if this is like if i'm a writer of 10 like what if i'm like it's my own production like you know so mm -hmm. i have to eventually think about that eventually as i go into the next project yeah of angelito but yeah so i did angelito bound and out four um and I would hear, I always wanted to write, like, uh, I always wanted people to laugh at something mm. that I wrote, like, to, to, to find it funny. And people did. People, like, found it funny. People were, like, turned on. It was all the things it that I like, really wanted to do. Hot. <laughs> like, everyone in the audience was fanning themselves after that scene. They're like, like, is there a cigarette break after this? <laughs> like, or are we just going to keep moving? Okay. It was during, and the next, like, intermission was next. And so yeah. people had a chance for a break. So, you, know, you, you eventually went and did the, you wrote... The, the full thing, yeah. People yeah. again. People were like, "I want to see this." People, but not just friends. People who I didn't know. People who were like worked in theater was like, "I want to see this yeah. world." Um, and I sat down and like there was like the sadness after Brown and Out. There's always like the sadness after the run is done, yeah. and like the, the 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 thing that we all worked so hard on, yeah, it's done. And so there's always just like sadness afterwards and so i i sat in that sadness and then i i you know again i was like i called in la comadre like Zaldua, and those native flutes and the incense and mm -hmm. um it was so that it was so easy to write the full story of angelito and it was during like lent which is when the story takes place and mm -hmm. it was it was so easy to write i saw the the stage reading of it you did. Thank you for your box office management those two nights. Yeah. That's all you. No, it's, it's, it was no big deal. <laughs> I'm happy to help, of course. I, that's how much I loved it, honestly. Is there a future for Angelito? Yeah. Like, what are you also, what, are you working on anything else? Like, There has to be a, fu a future for it. I feel super called mm -hmm. for it to be shown. Um, I got encouraged to apply for Outfest out festuses um like feature full length screenwriting mm -hmm. program so i'm looking for that when it when it, it it's available and uh, a huge shout out to mateo to matthew benjamin ramos for his um lead executive production of it mm -hmm. and for all of the challenging and the pushing that he did with me mm -hmm. around the value of my work and work and having it witnessed and shown yeah um and he and I will convene about next Great. next steps. Yeah. And so I will probably have to go back into like fundraising mode and all of that, which is really hard to do. But yeah. um, I'm super encouraged by it. And I just feel like there's, you know, there's, there's so much in that story that uh, I really want people to experience. Yeah. And the night, those two nights afterwards, when I spoke to the audience, like I was not afraid like I was for Hercules. Mm. So that was a huge yeah. step for me. And because that's growth, an actor, growing. huge growth. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a lot of pee turned down my leg. <laughs> and um, the night of rehearsal, we had one rehearsal, an actor like messed up his dates. And so I was like, I'm sorry, I can't be there. So I had to step in. Mm -hmm. And so I got to perform and embody two characters, two of the elder characters. Yeah. Um, which I, in that moment or afterwards, I, the night before I realized I was like, oh, I, this reading is actually not for people to see this reading is for me to embody these two characters. Yeah. So I, I had a lot of healing from that and that was really powerful. Yeah. And one was like the native elder. Yeah. So that was, yeah. And I, I mean, I will keep an eye out for that and, Thank you. and sort of to that, like, where can people follow you so they can see the update so they can donate so they can contribute so they can collaborate yeah. uh my website is unmaskededucation.com mm -hmm. all one word unmaskededucation and my instagram is unmaskedgilbert 
which is also my Twitter. Okay. And so going back to the <laughs> the original play is not called Hercules. It's called Unmasking Hercules. Mm. And the actors wear masks throughout the play. And yeah. then there's an actual unmasking. And so that has been a metaphor for my own growth mm. of unmasking. Uh, this is an opportunity where I ask people, like, who are writers, creators, artists that you admire, people that we should know about, people that maybe I should interview? So let's see. What uh, do you got? I think of I have all these names now. So I feel like any queer Chicanex, Latinx writer should read Gloria and Dozua's Borderlands. Mm-hmm. Um, I, uh, Bless Me Ultima is my favorite novel. And Rolfo Anaya really like wrote like my parents and my, my abuela. So mm. that was a huge influence. Yeah. Um, Benjamin Alire Sainez is a huge, was a huge influence on Hercules. He's like a YA, a youth adult novel, mm. also a poet too, uh, from Texas who came out like later in his life mm. as a professor. So, like the Aristotle and Dante discover the secrets of the universe, and I think the inexplicable logic of someone uh, is the name of his other novel that was like I literally would read it and cry. Like I had <laughs> never like bawled. Yeah, I think of this play called still the best reading of a play I I have ever seen. It was called The Watts, and it was about the land that Watts is on, mm-hmm. and it was written by um, Ivan Helena Ordaz, which I believe is also the, who she was the, I don't know if she was the showrunner, but she was also the, or the writer for the East Lost oh, show cool. on Netflix that was on Netflix. Um, yeah. So that play was like crafted so mm-hmm. well, and I think researched really well, because research, I think, is a big part of writing. Yeah. So I think about those folks. I think about there's a writer that's really impacted me. She is the Ono. Um, her name is Ophelia Zepeda. And so she's one of the first like uh, writers, like published writers from the tribe um, that's published uh, like uh, poems about the land and the earth and the mm. rain. And so yeah. those were really powerful because I feel like I was calling those in when I was initially writing both plays without even really knowing it. Mm. And so she, as an indigenous native writer, has been super impactful for me. Now, the last question I ask everybody is that they help me title their episode. Okay. So there is a prompt, and you can move the words around. You can add as many as you want. Okay. Because the purpose, well, the prompt is a blank Latinx writer. Mm. And that is, so when I promote your episode, I'll post that. And people will see that and think, oh, that's like me. Like, oh, I didn't, like, what? Like. There's somebody else like this? Like, I got to listen to this. And it's also as like a recruitment tool. So if everyone sees all these podcast episodes and their titles, they'll say, hey, they haven't said, they haven't talked about me yet. I haven't seen myself reflected in any of these. And they'll reach out to be added to the to the collective, the list. I, um, I got it. It came. Okay. <laughs> super quick, super f- fast. Okay. Um, I feel the calling. And it's a thing that I've never done before that I said... Uh, I would not sure when I would be comfortable saying it, but okay. I feel like the calling now. So I'm gonna um, root myself and ground myself in ancestors that I am still meeting through prayer and ritual, um, and call out other folks, uh, and be curious and adventurous and have the pee run down my leg. And I'm gonna say uh, a native Latinx writer. Great. Yeah. That's powerful. Yeah. It feels. I feel yeah. all tingly. Yeah. <laughs> It's a good sign. Yeah. I.